She knew you were disappointed in her, it would just break her heart. It still works even today, even though I try real hard not to do it, <laughs> right? Because she has a very soft heart. That's the discipline that was most effective. We didn't need to spank her because spanking was ineffective in comparison to just sitting her down and talking to her. My middle daughter, you could talk until you were blue in the face and it didn't matter. <laughs> you know, talking never got anywhere with it. And matter of fact, you could spank her un until your hand was sore and it didn't matter either. You know, the only thing that worked for her is to make her sit still. <laughs> we learned that early on. And so our discipline with my daughter, Melissa, was just to sit her in a chair and say, you can't do anything. You can't go anywhere. You just have to sit there. And boy, that was torture for her. <laughs> that was the worst thing we could do for her. My son, we tried everything with him. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think corporal punishment was about the only thing that worked uh, for him. A little bit. <laughs> A little bit that worked. It's not wrong to spank your child, but it's wrong to hurt your child. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? All discipline would, ought to be done in order to affect positive change in your child's life because you love them, because you love them. And sometimes spanking, physically spanking, isn't the best form of discipline for your child. If that's all you're doing, you're probably missing an opportunity to get your know your child better and find effective ways to bring discipline in their lives. Does God discipline us? Amen. You know, the Bible says, spare the rod and spoil the child. And what it means by that is that if a, a child without discipline will become an adult without discipline and will ultimately injure the child instead of help the child. And so as God loves us, he brings discipline into our lives because he loves us. And he spanks us once in a while through different circumstances, all knowing us better than we know ourselves. So he knows exactly what needs to happen in order to discipline us. Hebrews says, every child whom he loves, he disciplines. If he loves you, he will bring discipline in your life. But he does it in a tailor-made way so that it can be most effective, so it can be most beneficial to you. So we should discipline our children, bringing them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, the verse goes on to say, in the, in the instruction of the Lord, as some uh, versions as well say, in the, bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. So our model for how we discipline ought to be how God disciplines us. Right? That ought to be our model. And sometimes, sometimes he has to, he has to spank us, <laughs> you know? He has to use some terrible circumstance. If we've gone that far away from him, sometimes he has to get our attention. And he may use some terrible circumstances, allow some terrible things to happen in your life out of his love for you so that he can help you to know that he loves you and that he's waiting for you to return. He's waiting for you to come home. He's waiting for you to be right with him. Uh, that's part of the instruction of the Lord. But there's also much more instruction from the Lord. I, I want to share with you, if you want your children to have the best chance in life, they need to be exposed to this book. They need to know what this book says. This is God's word to us. We need to spend time as a family in God's word. We need to spend time as a family in the church in God's word. Unite the two institutions that God created so that your family has the best possible chance of knowing him and knowing his word. Amen? Uh, that's a, such a benefit to your family. The time to start it is now. <laughs> if you've never done it before, do it now. Get your family in church. I know uh, our family oftentimes was, uh, we were warned that we were going to be sorry because we made our children go to church. Well, there's a couple things about that. Number one, we're not sorry because our children were blessed by being in church. 
But number two, we didn't make our children go to church. It was just who we were as a family. You understand what I'm saying? It, was, it wasn't really a, 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 a conflict every week. We didn't have to get up on Sunday morning and decide, are we going to church today? Because that's what we did. That was part of being a part of our family is we went to church together. It really wasn't a choice. It's just who we were as a family. And so it wasn't the big conflict that some people imagine. And if you only, only have your children go with you to church once a month or once every six months or once a year, then yes, it can be a conflict because that's not their habit and that's not who you are as a family. Who you are as a family is displayed by what you do as a family. Amen? And if you're a family that attends church, then your family is going to be blessed by that attendance at church. Bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It's got to happen at home, but the church can be a great aid to that as well. Come together as a family to the church. Uh, the Bible says, Forsake not the assembly of yourselves together as the habit of some, but all the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, we should desire to be in his house all the more. Uh, as we see the world falling apart, and as we see the day of the Lord coming, we should be, desire to be in his house all the more because of that. Then the last thing about homework, making the homework. The last thing about that is home and work. How do you relate to your job? You've talked about how children are to relate to their parents. Husbands relate to their wives. Children relate to their parents. Parents to their children. How do you relate to your job, because is that important for making your homework? Yeah, it is, it is. There is something in that parent rap about dad bringing home the cheese, <laughs> you know? Dad doing the work, uh, bringing home the resources necessary. Moms and dads today both oftentimes work. How you work makes a difference, and this passage has some, uh, some illustrations of that for us to look at very quickly. Uh, in verse 5, it says, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So what's that saying? When we work for someone, we should work for them as we were working for the Lord. We should work for them not to be pleasing in their sight, but to be pleasing in the Lord's sight. Have you ever worked with somebody who worked harder about not working than they would have if they just would have buckled down and worked? <laughs> have you ever seen that before? I mean, they're so constantly looking around the corner for when the boss is coming. <laughs> if they just invested their time in getting their job done, they wouldn't have to worry. They'd be around another corner by then, <laughs> right? They work so hard it's at avoiding work that they, well, that's not pleasing uh, to the boss. And it's certainly not pleasing to the Lord. And it's setting a bad example for our children as well, right? Uh, it's, it's not building for the home. And it's endangering our family because we're not working properly uh, for the Lord. And, and then verse 8, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. The reason that you really should work for your boss like you should is because it's not just the paycheck in the end that matters. It's what the Lord's going to bring into your life because you've worked that way. If you're working from your heart, if you're working in, with the right spirit, if you're working with the right attitude, the Lord's going to bring back blessings on you that can't really be measured in your bank account. He's going to bring back blessings on you, a satisfaction. I remember... Being on unemployment, I was on unemployment for two weeks. The reason it was only two weeks, I, was actually, I took a job for making less money than I was making on unemployment because I felt so lousy <laughs> all the time I was on unemployment. You, you understand what I'm saying? Because you're getting paid for doing nothing. And, and, and I, just, I just felt so bad about that, that I went to work in a service station making quite a bit less on my unemployment check so that I could have some of the benefits of feeling good about myself, a feeling like at least the, what I was earning, at least the money that I got was something that I earned along the way. 
Now, it's okay, unemployment, you paid into it so that you can receive the benefit of that if you need it for a time. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm saying that there are benefits for working when we have the opportunity to work. There are benefits that far outweigh the, the benefits of not working and having the wrong attitude uh, about working. Amen? Amen. You may have the right attitude, you just can't work because there's no jobs available. That's a different story, okay? It's a whole different story. But if you are working, you need to work as unto the Lord because it will benefit you and it will benefit your family. And your family will be able to be more secure and stronger because of it. And then finally, masters, if you're an employer, do the same things to them. Give up threatening, knowing that both your master and yours are in heaven and there's no partiality with him. Now, I understand that this is written in the, the context of our work obligation. I don't know how many of you supervise other people. If you supervise someone else, then please take note of this passage of Scripture and give up threatening. Just treat them with respect and love. Treat them with no partiality, and you'll have a better employee because of it, and ultimately you'll be blessed as well. But I want to just apply this very quickly to what we've been discussing about the family. We are, as parents, in essence, masters of our house and of our children. How should we treat our children? Should we not treat them with respect as well? And do you know that no matter what age that child is, they have an equal standing before God as that you do? Do you know that God is watching over their lives like he's watching over your life? Do you know that God sees everything that happens to them just like he sees everything that happens to you? Do you know that the, the ground at the foot of the cross is level? That the Bible tells us that there's no partiality with God? That it tells us there is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free? nor male, nor female, that everybody comes to Christ in the same way, the same level, and that God loves everyone exactly the same. He loves that child of yours just as much as he loves you. How you treat that child is very important because you should treat them as God would treat them in your place. Amen? With love, respect, and they will respond with love and respect to you. Amen? Amen. God can make a difference in your home if you do the home work. If you make your home work according to the word of God. Amen? He can make a difference in your home. In your relationship with your spouse, in your relationship with your children, in their relationship with you, ultimately even as you Go to work to earn the money so that your home can be secure, so that your home uh, can be established. If you respond the way God wants you to respond, your home will be blessed. Amen? Amen. Your home will be blessed. God has a plan for you. It's right here in his book. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer? I know I haven't spoken too much about an evangelistic message at all, but I never know how God has been speaking to people during the week. If God has been speaking to your heart about your need to receive Jesus as your Savior, I encourage you to make that decision during this invitation time. I'd love to share with you how you can come to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If God's spoken to your heart about something else that he's brought up to you, only if God has spoken to you, I invite you to come and if maybe God's put something on your heart that you need prayer for, and I'd be glad to pray with you about whatever it is God's put on your heart. Why don't you come as, as, we, as we sing together in just a moment. Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning. Lord, we thank you that you love us so very, very much, that you would give your son to die for us. And Lord, for those who do not yet know you, I pray, Lord, that they would understand where they can be with you, not only where they are in sin, but, Lord, where you want them to be in forgiveness. Lord, I thank you that you have given your Son to forgive us and to love us into your kingdom. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to take to
to heart the lessons that we can learn from your scripture, especially as it relates to our family, to our children, and our children to their parents. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to honor and respect them, that you would help us to love and to discipline them. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do exactly what you have asked us to do so that we might see your blessing uh, fall upon our lives and our family's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all please stand as we sing together? If God's spoken to your heart, I'm here. I'd be loved to talk to you about what God is saying in your heart. <laughs>